Thank you guys for all being here and signing up for today's talk. Um, as mentioned, I'm Charlotte Wood. I'm currently Senior Marketing Manager at the Art Fund. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about my journey from studying history of art to marketing art. So I'm going to talk to you about how I came to be in my current role, what museum marketing really entails, but most importantly, some lessons that I've learned along the way that I hope will be of use to you as you now embark on your future careers in the creative industries. So if I could hope for you to take away at least three things from today's talk, it would be working with and or in museums is incredibly rewarding. The people and the passion that comes with working in this sector is something I cannot emphasise enough. I cannot imagine working on a daily basis for something I didn't believe in and marketing a product or a service that I was also not a consumer of. Secondly, aim high. No one else is going to do that for you. Who you want to be is one of the greatest assets that you have. So there should be no limit to your ambition, whether it's making tea for free for the brand that you would love on your CV or turning everyday mundane tasks in a temporary job into future transferable opportunities. And thirdly, be inquisitive and interested. Always ask questions, strive to find out more, but acknowledge that we're all constantly learning in this sector. So if you had asked me 15 years ago when I was leaving school that I'd now be working in museum marketing, I'd have said, OK, I know what museums are and I love them. And I think marketing is the same as advertising and I know I want to work in a creative industry, but I was never really good enough to be the creative because I couldn't draw a sufficient A-star worthy bowl of fruit at school. But how is mar art marketing even a real job and how would I get there? So to take you from my school years where I studied art history, classics and English A-levels, or the DOS subjects as they're affectionately known by the scientists and mathematicians, uh, I chose to study art history at Nottingham University. Uh, and this here is the Genogli Art Gallery, which was adjacent to where our lectures were held. So I may have only had nine hours of tutored time every week, but around this I was reading, learning, and subconsciously prepping for my future career, whether I knew it or not. I'd be visiting galleries, thinking, thinking critically, and engaging with visual culture on many levels. So this is me, um, and as I work in marketing, it seemed only right to give a little brand endorsement to my career path. So from university, via work placements, part-time jobs, an internship at mydeco.com, to a year as trade marketing manager at Vandal Shoes, I ended up working for the V&A as marketing manager for nearly six years, which led to my current role here at Art Fund, which I joined in April 2016. So my first lesson is always think outside the picture frame. And by that, I mean, how can you talk about what you're doing right now and translate those skills for where you want to head outside that space, even if you don't think it's relevant? I think I always knew that my passion for the arts might not be enough, so I used every summer holiday to intern and do work experience to develop my office skills. In my last year of uni, I moved to Melbourne as part of my degree, a like-for-like -like semester swap where I got to study at Melbourne Uni, which broadened my ideas of where I could take the degree and my career. I worked part-time in a commercial gallery who provided one-off additions to hotels and restaurants. Once again, just looking at ways that I could work with art but gain business acumen at the same time. And this was really sort of a driving force behind my master's degree in management and marketing. That was an incredibly tough year work-wise. The hours were intense. I was working on things like information systems and I'm still not really sure what that was. Uh, research methods and finance alongside marketing, which I quickly realized I think was where my skill set lie. So if I could apply working in a marketing environment for a product or service that I felt passionate about, then I think I was sort of on my way to finding my direction. So much so that when it came to final semester projects, I did marketing case studies for brands and organizations that I wanted to know more about or even possibly work at. For example, a marketing project on the V&A, and then finally a real-life project on a local Nottinghamshire social history museum, looking at ways to increase visitor numbers. Knowing that if I had ever had a marketing, museum marketing interview, I'd have already done some research and gathered some key skills. And by this point, I knew I was a creative thinker. I enjoyed teamwork. I loved working on projects with clear, tangible outcomes. And I was still passionate about museums. This all paid off in 2010 when I applied for the job of marketing officer at the V&A. And at the time, I was trade marketing manager for Vandal Shoes, based in Norwich, or the footwear brand for middle-aged ladies with wide feet, as it was commonly known. Uh, I was traveling the country, advising retailers on visual merchandising and promotional opportunities. A great year's experience, but London was definitely calling. 
So by the time that I saw the V&A job description, I knew I could translate some of those core skills such as communication, social media, e-news, briefing designers from the commercial world into the museum sector. So I thought I would just briefly share this definition of marketing a museum, which can be found on the V&A website. I can't take credit for this as a resource, and some of the digital marketing information is a little out of date, but don't tell my old colleagues that, that I said that. But the wider information is still all relevant and was really useful for me when I was prepping for jobs. So as you can see, creativity, planning, organization, and problem solving are just some of the core skills that are required. So my next point is about being inquisitive and whether that's people, places, new opportunities, or ways of looking. I clearly remember walking down the South Kensington Tunnel on my way to the V&A job interview, full of nerves, about two hours too early, and slightly jet-lagged, having flown in from a holiday with my art history university friends. One at the time was working at the Whitechapel Gallery, another in a commercial gallery, and the other for Sky on their marketing grad scheme, and they became my sort of interview prep panel. So use all your contacts for all it's worth. And I don't necessarily always mean the person that your parents might know who can get you work experience, but your wider network, the people sitting next to you now, those really rich and interesting conversations and skills that you can share, people that you can follow on social media, uh, and even approach small organizations and startups with ideas about how you could help their business. A friend of mine hounded a, hounded a gallery director on LinkedIn when she moved to Hong Kong and wanted a job. There wasn't one, but she made herself interesting and her skill set very visible to the right people, and it paid off. And in addition to that, I know this is also a pretty obvious tip, but always ask questions at the end of an interview. I remember asking my boss during the V&A interview what her favorite campaign was to work on. It shows you're not only interested in the organization, but the people, because interpersonal skills and relationship building are an essential component to this area of work. So, day to day, what did marketing at the V&A look like? I was responsible for the marketing campaigns for major exhibitions and overseeing our digital marketing activity. My key objectives were to increase visitor numbers, build the V&A's brand, increase public awareness of our services and events, increase revenue through temporary exhibitions, such as Bowie, which you see here, uh, and attract new audiences. So I did everything from work with the design team, and some of you may, be, may have been here on Saturday when you heard from Jo Glover, who is currently head of Tate. Uh, she spoke here on Saturday, and I worked closely with her for many years. We would decide what the campaign identity would look like. I'd plan and book the advertising campaign with the media agency, and this would involve you know, looking at the frequency and schedule of posters for the London Underground, digital advertising, press adverts, postcard distribution, and how else we were gonna reach our target audience. For major exhibitions, I would work approximately one year in advance of opening, working very closely with press and digital on the big announcements, setting up ticketing with visitor services teams, meeting promotional partners and corporate sponsors to discuss how we could leverage the campaign with additional in-kind support. It was very, very cross-departmental, so I don't think there was actually one team that the marketing team didn't work with. Being the v &A, you might think it's all about big, spectacular, elaborate work and launch events, but the reality was really a day-to-day -day office environment with challenges that any job brings. Uh, working with curators was incredibly inspiring and a real privilege, but not without frustrations. For example, when they would want the most famous work in the exhibition to be the star of the advertising campaign, but from a marketing perspective, there was a much stronger arresting image, which you knew would catch people's attention and draw those audiences in. I got to work with some of the most talented designers, both 2D and 3D, who might, not, who might want to present the campaign identity one way, but I also had to manage the needs of corporate sponsors. Many discussions around the size of their logos on our posters. So this job really involves strong negotiation, people management, and communication skills. And you can see here just a few examples of the marketing campaigns that I worked on, from Hollywood Costume, David Bowie, Chinese paintings, shoes, the fabric of India, and horse photographer of style. Uh, you can probably guess that a particular highlight for me was had to be working on the Bowie campaign, where we drew in over 312,000 people. This was 36% over target and attracted new, visit, new museum visitors, which was a primary marketing objective. And if you'd like to read any more about that particular marketing campaign, there's an in-depth case study on the Culture Hive website. So ask me later if you want any more details about that. So after nearly six years at the V&A, it felt like the right time to see what else was out there. 
I'd had the very best organisation in my chosen field on my CV. I'm slightly biased about that, though. Um, and it continues to open doors, networks, contacts, and learning opportunities. So my lesson here is you learn even more by moving on and knowing when that time is right. I knew I didn't want to step into another museum or gallery in the same position, but I didn't want to leave the sector entirely. And that is easier said than done. The sector is not as big as you might think. It's one of its strengths when it comes to relationship building, but it also when it comes to new op op job opportunities, one of its challenges. So when a senior marketing manager role came up at the Art Fund, which I saw purely by accident as I was invited to my predecessor's leaving drinks, I knew I had to go for it. And I want to make a point here about job applications. I think there's sometimes a tendency as we work in the creative industries to try and be too clever, creative, or overcomplicated. If the job description has clear headings and bullet points, for the person requirements, then use those literally line by line for each and give one example for something you've done to demonstrate that you have that experience. Employers certainly don't have the time to read between the lines. So from South Kensington to Granary Square, and 15 months later, I now know more about fundraising than I ever did. I have a broader understanding of the sector from both national and regional museum perspectives, but also how much more there is still to learn and excite me. So even more so than a marketing position in a museum, this role is incredibly unique and multifaceted. A fundraising charity, exclusively for museums and galleries, we provide marketing support for 700 venues to attract visitors, engage new audiences, and generate income, and at the same time, raise awareness for art fund programs amongst an arts professional audience. I don't think that person at university would have believed this was actually a job. So you could say that it's quite similar to an agency role, day-to-day uh, -day account management for over 700 clients, and those clients being our museum, gallery, library, and historic house venues who form our network, either via funding or marketing support. No day is the same. For example, in the last fortnight, I've flown to Rotterdam to attend a museum conference, an opportunity to, to meet some UK partners, discuss current sector challenges, and via event sponsorship, raise awareness for the work that we do. From there, I met a design agency who are redesigning the marketing materials we provide our partners. I've gone up to the Hepworth Wakefield to host a workshop with some of our Yorkshire museums, see their new Howard Hodgkin exhibition, and discuss our marketing support for the Art Fund Museum of the Year campaign, which they won last week, which I hope you all are aware of. Uh, and here are just a few examples of some of the wider promotional support that we offer museums, from exhibition guides that we distribute across all partner venues, and my team worked tirelessly to research and gather all the UK information about what, what exhibitions are coming up, to the annual art map that you can see in the middle here, which we give to all of our 123,000 National Art Pass members to show them where they can visit region by region. We also support a number of touring exhibitions, on the right is an artist's rooms exhibi exhibition of Ron Murek's work at the Ferens Art Gallery in Hull. Also a moment to celebrate Hull as UK city of culture and raise awareness for some of the inspiring work that is going on in that particular region. As I've mentioned before, relationship building and cultivation for, for me right now with marketing teams and front of house staff is essential. This work is really all about partnerships. Here are just a few other examples of public engagement activities. On the left um, is a Valentine's Day initiative that we did to engage museum staff to say thank you for welcoming our members, but also raise awareness for a new Plus One membership card that we launched. So not only did it provide them with essential information, it got them sharing it on social media, feeling positive about our wider partnership, and it, this was all done via the medium of chocolate. Uh, and on the right, we've got um, an example of, us work, of myself working closely with the National Art Pass marketing team. We're currently promoting a Summer of Art campaign, you may have seen it, um, again to provide awareness for museum visitors, but also to provide museums with essential summer outdoor furniture, constantly finding ways to service both audience needs with charm and substance. We also continue to innovate and support museums with a range of digital initiatives, such as Art Tickets, um, which is a not-for-profit online ticket management uh, and sales platform for small to medium-sized museums. We also run the UK's first free crowdfunding platform called Art Happen, so I encourage you all to take a look at the website and have a look at some projects that you'd love to donate to. Both of these projects are a central part of our strategy to help museums financially, but also to develop the sector's ability to engage and understand its audiences. So that's quite a whistle-stop tour of my eight years in museum marketing. 
I'm wishing you all a lot of luck as you plan your creative career path. And I just wanted to end because I feel like the talk needs, always needs to end on an inspirational call to purpose. So apologies for using a quote of a quote, but I'm a big fan of Paul Arden's books. He's a former creative director at Saatchi and Saatchi and a big fan of Richard Avedon's photography. And he says, the best piece of advice ever given was by the art director of Harper's Bazaar, Alexei Brodovich, to the young Richard Avedon, destined to become one of the world's greatest photographers. The advice was simple, astonish me. So bear this in mind as you all embark on your creative, uh, creative roles. So thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, obviously you can feel free to ask me now, later, or during a bit of a Q&A after the talk. And is it Lysia? There she is. I'm also delighted to be joined today by Lysia Lobo, who's commercial director at the Ashmolean, a partner museum, an ex-colleague from the V&A, and an inspiring contact to know. I told you the sector was very small. There we go. Thank you um, for that inspiring talk. It was great. And even working with you, there were things there I'd never heard before. So um, it was fantastic to see. Um, today, I really want to talk to you about where it all began. Um, my, my start out um, wasn't where I thought it would be. And I think um, it's really taking all those things and those things that you learn along the way that is quite key um, in everything that you do in life, not just your, your work or your, your career. So I really wanted to start with uh, 1988, at the age of five, um, I was sent to a very academic school in North London. The choice for my parents was very simple, I was following my academic sister. But going somewhere like Haberdashers didn't define me academically, but it set me on a path which gave me core skills that enabled me to define my own path in life, a much more creative path. I was always creative, I was quite social, and I always took part in non-academic activities. The learning piece was just a bolt-on, really. So sport, music, art, they were my things. I was very chatty, and I loved talking to people. It was funny, because it wasn't until I was an adult I was told that I didn't get into this academic school based on my ability. I got in because I was talking to others in the sandpit and made them feel included. Two skills which are now paramount for the role that I now do. So it's quite funny how things turn out. So I started working for Waterstones at 16 and I completed my A-levels in maths, accounting and design technology. I came from a family of accountants, so it made sense. But for me, it was the creative piece. It became clear that actually the numeracy part was going to be a base for my future career commercial piece coming out soon but it was the design A-level element that I was really really passionate about. So in 1998 I was competing nationally and internationally for judo. I said earlier it was sport, art and music and in 2000 I went to Sydney before I started university as a Great Britain Reserve. Sadly I didn't get to compete, no one got injured unfortunately, but I learned a lot about people. I was 17 years old in a country that I knew nobody in, but I built resilience, disappointment, and how to work well as a team, but also celebrate success when things go well. I then started um, to work for Thorntons. I joined Loughborough University to do my art foundation course, followed by a BTEC in science and engineering. I was still really unsure on what I wanted to do. Which design course was it? I looked into industrial design, and I looked into 3D design. Industrial design meant I wouldn't be able to do sport or have a job along the side. It was nine to five every day. So of course I opted for 3D design. It meant I only had to go in for three hours a day. I kept my part-time job. I continued to do sport, fitting in extra studio time where I could. My Thornton's career was really the start of my career path. I used to head off up to Derby for secondments during holidays everything from visual merchandising, marketing, store operations. And in the end, for my final year project, I collaborated with the Women's Institute and made a chocolate bonsai tree with silver brooches, the leaves they could then remove and wear for their 90th anniversary. I really was utilizing the networks I had around me and made them work for my advantage. I graduated from Loughborough in 2005 and continued to work for Thorntons. The timing was perfect. 
A full-time management role came up in Leicester and I decided to take it. It didn't matter as a smaller store. It didn't matter I didn't live in Leicester. It was just my opportunity to start working my way up the ladder. I attended courses, training, put myself forward for projects. And after seven years with Thorntons, getting as far as I could, without any other outside experience, I made the very difficult decision to move on to Signet. So Signet is H. Samuel and Ernest Jones, but I thought, hang on a minute, I specialised in jewellery and silversmithing in my final year. I've got my maths and my accounting. Perfect combination for a jeweller and the leading jeweller in both the UK and the US. As the head of customer experience, I cared about customers and the product that they were buying. This combined with my 3D design degree felt like a perfect fit. Finally, I was there using my degree. It was unfortunately slightly short-lived and in 2013, I was asked to join the v &A as the head of retail and catering operations. They wanted someone who had both a commercial high street and art design background. Perfect combination, I had both. These were the things that were starting to really fall into place for me. What better to work for one of the leading museums, not only in England, but all over the world. I was privileged to work with the Bowie and Alexandra McQueen estates on product to support the exhibition. Everything from audio guides to 48-hour openings, from last-minute catalogue changes to unloading delivery trucks through the night, it was all worth it. And ultimately, it was about the passion that I had for what I did. So, what am I doing now? Well, in January 2016, I was asked to join the Ashmolean. It is about the networking. It is about what you do. I had gone up to um, Oxford in October 2015 to do a presentation on catering strategy. Very few people knew how to work with catering partners, and both the Oxford Museums and the V&A were working with the same catering partner. So I decided to present how you can best work with this partner. And in the audience was the director of the Ashmolean. He asked me to join the Ashmolean in January 2016, so with a very heavy heart, I made the choice to leave the V&A after just three years with them. But what do I actually do? Well, as you all know, um, commercial funding, uh, fundraising, um, anything from uh, fundraising by the government or large uh, donors is becoming more difficult. We don't charge for our museum, we only charge for our exhibitions. So we have to drive the revenue from the visitor. So I look after the shops, the publishing department, licensing, the picture library, catering, venue hire, exhibition ticketing and membership, all revenue streams that stem directly from the visitor. It helps to keep those museums do doors open each day. So I thought I'd share with you today um, some of the products and some of the things that we do. So everything from visual merchandising, retail assistants, managers, photography manager, online shop manager, displays, buying and visual. They all have backgrounds in either retail, publishing or art. We take the collections, we look at them, we do our research and we take those collections to products. We have an online shop, an online shop that generates over £70,000 a year. It was only started four years ago. Online is the way that not only high street stores are going, but museums are too. So it's important that we invest with the right people, recruit the right people from both art and high street backgrounds to help take us on that journey. Here are some of the product development ranges. And some of the things that we've talked about earlier was around those networking and people you know. Well, it is a very small industry. The ex-head of retail from the Natural History in London has now joined in collaboration with a company called Dinks Limited and has helped me develop these products. I want to share with you a case study with a gentleman called Rafa Penador. He's a jewellery designer and he's got a family and he now looks after his three kids at home. And one day he was at the school gates and he was talking um, to one of my friends, an ex-colleague actually, who, who I used to work with at Thornton's. And he was saying that he wanted to get his jewellery into museums. I haven't seen my colleague now um, for a number of years and um, she got in touch via LinkedIn and she said, I know you're in museums, you don't suppose you can help him out. So one afternoon last year, I met him at the British Museum. 
It was equal distance between both of us. And we had a look at his jewellery. It was fantastic. We were in this fantastic museum looking at this beautiful jewellery that he gets inspired from this under the sea. Rafa was uh, in his early days of his jewellery. He had his own account on Etsy. He's got his own social media following, but he hadn't got any supporting material. How do I know how to look after this material? How is he going to package it for my customers? What price was he going to sell it at? All of these things that he hadn't considered going into a retail environment. So I shared my expertise with him, and together we now sell Rafa Penador. His jewellery alone takes in excess of £25,000 a year in our shop. We're just one person he supplies to. So, if I'm going to leave you some top tips and some attributes that we look for when we're looking for um, employees, the key here isn't about your background. It's fundamentally about your attitude and your passion. So have a strong work ethic. Think about that first moment somebody's going to meet you. Look to learn new skills and try new things. Just don't be afraid. It's okay to make a mistake. Put yourself forward. Step out of your comfort zone. Be pe prepared to sacrifice. I remember those long days and hours when I was at university, also working at Thornton's. I had to miss out on that odd day at the Students' Union, but it was worth it. Put in a little bit extra. Don't just give what they expect. Network and talk to people. That is so key. And ultimately, enjoy what you're doing and have fun doing it. I don't feel like I go to work every day. I enjoy what I do. So that would be my parting comment. Thank you.